Welcome to our lecture online. Now let's take a look at the atmosphere of the Earth as compared to the atmosphere of the other three terrestrial planets and the atmosphere in general. Of course, for life to be able to exist, for us to be able to exist, we need to live on a planet that's a terrestrial planet close enough to the sun, large enough to be, to be able to hang on to its atmosphere. But it's not just that it has an atmosphere, that it has to be the correct atmosphere. And the Earth happens to have just about the perfect atmosphere for life to exist, for us to be able to exist. To get a feel for that, let's compare it to the other three planets. Now, of course, Mercury, there's not a lot to uh, compare to because Mercury has virtually no atmosphere. Somebody may say, well, it does have a little bit of an atmosphere. That's because the, uh, being nearby the sun, it receives what we call particles from the sun. They temporarily stay around the, the planet just long enough to say that it has a very, very, very tenuous atmosphere. But it's just correct to say, just ignore it. There's no atmosphere there. There's virtually nothing to breathe. But when we go to Venus and Mars, notice that their atmospheres are very similar to one another and extremely different from the atmosphere of the Earth. Notice that 96% of the atmosphere of Venus is carbon dioxide and for Mars it's 95%. And the reason why there's so much carbon dioxide on both of those planets is because essentially they had oceans before. Now for Mars we're pretty sure they did. For Venus, it's still theoretical, but there's no reason to believe that at one point in time, Venus did not have oceans on the surface, just like the Earth does today. All that ocean boiled away for Venus, and with Mars, there was not enough atmospheric pressure to maintain that liquid water, so it ended up disappearing as well. And the remnants of that is that there's an extreme amount of carbon dioxide because the available oxygen would combine with carbon and therefore they have a lot of carbon dioxide on the atmosphere. Notice they both have a significant amount of nitrogen. Of course, compared to the rest of the atmosphere, it's only 3%. For the Earth, Nitrogen makes up 78% of the atmosphere, which is a little bit more than three quarters of the atmosphere. Now, of course, when you think about Venus, Venus has probably more nitrogen in its atmosphere than the Earth does because there's so much more atmosphere on Venus. So it seems to be reasonable to expect that planet, that terrestrial planets probably will have a certain amount of nitrogen in their atmosphere. What's, of course, also very unique that the Earth has oxygen in the atmosphere, which is completely lacking on Mars and Venus. If you were to go to Mars or Venus, and for some reason you took off your spacesuit, well, first of all, on Venus, you wouldn't last very long because it's just too hot. You'd simply burn to death from the heat. But if you could live, if somehow you could survive the temperature, of course, breathing carbon dioxide, you wouldn't last very long either. Same with Mars, you would take off your helmet and first of all what would happen is that the difference in pressure would be too enormous, there's just not enough pressure there and you might start bleeding everywhere, that it would just be not a pretty sight when you're exposed to almost zero atmospheric pressure. But then if you still could breathe the atmosphere again, 95% carbon dioxide, you wouldn't last very long there either. We have the correct perfect atmosphere, not only that we have a lot of nitrogen in, in the atmosphere, but we also have a fair amount of oxygen. Not too much and not too little. If there was far less oxygen than that, then it would not be good. There would not be enough oxygen there for animals to breathe. And if there was more oxygen there, it would become a very dangerous planet because then if you were to light a match, the whole atmosphere might blow up. So it has the right amount of oxygen. It also has a little bit of argon, argon just like, like Mars does, and a tiny amount of carbon dioxide, and that tiny amount of carbon dioxide is actually a good thing. We probably don't want too much of it, but that's probably a good thing, and we'll see later on why that is a good thing. Now, what are the benefits for the Earth's atmosphere? If we say that it's the correct atmosphere for people to be able to exist on this planet, and of course, we haven't found any other planets that has a similar atmosphere as the Earth. Well, first of all, the benefits are that we can have liquid water on the surface, but that, of course, any atmosphere with enough atmospheric pressure could do that. Secondly, it is a good temperature moderator between day and night. If there wasn't 
enough of an atmosphere there or there was the wrong kind of atmosphere there then we wouldn't be able to keep days and nights roughly at the same temperature yes it does cool down at night but not too much and it doesn't heat up too much in the daytime again the atmosphere is very good at moderating the temperature between day and night if you go to the moon for example the difference between day and night is well over 200 degrees celsius and so therefore you can see that it's a lot better here because of the atmosphere the atmosphere also allows water to evaporate. So as water evaporates from the oceans, it gives us a tremendous cooling effect. It's one of the biggest cooling effects on the Earth is the ability to evaporate water vapor and have the water vapor rise up in the atmosphere closer to space where it can then deposit that heat back and then it can condense back up in the, in the atmosphere and rain back down to the Earth. So it's a tremendous cooling effect to have that evaporation. Another very good cooling effect and a movement of heat effect is the air currents. We have tremendous amount of heat currents. We have the, the winds, the trade winds that bring winds all across, all around the world. But we also have the jet streams that move warm layers of air and cold layers of air over thousands of miles or thousands of kilometers across the Earth. Again, moving these huge air masses around the Earth. Again, keeping the climate much more moderate because of that. And of course, because we have water vapor in the atmosphere and the movement of these air currents, we have what we call the hydrological cycle, where water is then deposited on land. If we didn't have that, our land would be like the Sahara Desert everywhere with no rain anywhere. If there was no rain anywhere, life couldn't simply not exist on land. But because we have the right atmosphere with the right contents in the hydro hydrological cycle, we have plenty of water in many places around the world for us to be able to live. Also, the atmosphere on the Earth, the specific components in the atmosphere, protect us against the very, very dangerous radiation that comes from space. Space is an extremely hazardous, dangerous place. And we're protected from those dangers because of our atmosphere. Because our atmosphere protects gamma rays, which are simply deadly, X-rays, which would also kill us over time, and UV rays, which also would cause a lot of damage to us if we're directly exposed to those UV rays. So because the atmosphere were protected from the three lethal forms of radiation out of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. So therefore, again, the atmosphere is perfect for doing that. Next, it protects us against meteor impacts, not the big ones. The big ones can still come right through and cause a lot of havoc and damage. But every day it's estimated that about 44 tons of debris lands on the Earth. And most of that debris is relatively small and our atmosphere is thick enough to be able to protect us from that. It, it simply burns up in the atmosphere and comes down as the rain of a little bit of dust. And so if that wasn't the case, if all that debris would come right through, of course, it would cause a lot of damage around the world on a daily basis. And finally, it is a source of oxygen. We couldn't live without oxygen. No animal life could live without oxygen. We need that oxygen, and our atmosphere contains 21% oxygen. So again, it's a perfect contents, not too much, not too little, for us to be able to have a planet with an atmosphere protecting us against all these things, moderating the temperatures, providing liquid water, and providing a source of oxygen. Why do we need oxygen? Well, all biological processes where we take food, we need to be able to utilize that food, and so we, we burn that through something called combustion reactions in our bodies that require oxygen and carbon to make to make energy for us and then we expel the carbon dioxide and the water is a byproduct of that combustion reaction but in order to have those combustion reactions within our bodies we have to have oxygen to do so and of course food present for us to eat but when it comes to the atmosphere again we have the right kind of atmosphere the right amount of atmosphere around the earth again because we have this perfect sized planet containing that perfect amount of atmosphere and, and maintaining the current balance of components within the atmosphere to keep us nice and warm and to keep us safe and to provide the oxygen for us to breathe. Wow, what a miracle in a way to think of it that that is why we're here and alive on this earth. So at what percent when the earth starts to explode of oxygen? Well, let's go to the limit. So the question was, what percentage of oxygen would become dangerous? 
And I've seen some tests and I've seen that when it gets up 25%, when you then light a match, that match will burn with much more ferocity. And so if that were to happen, imagine a forest fire. A forest fire with 25% oxygen would be much more ferocious than a forest fire with just 21%. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't take much more oxygen to make fires on Earth much more destructive. Imagine 100% oxygen or nearly 100% oxygen. If you were to just simply light a match, the whole, the whole atmosphere would simply explode. So you can see that after you go beyond 25% to 30%, 35%, any sort of spark from lightning, any sort of fire would have dire consequences. So again, 21% seems to be just the right amount. It doesn't take much more to start having fires burning at much more ferocity. That's a good question, actually. Is that what happened on that um, space flight? Uh, what was that? Which one was it? Well, it wasn't a space flight. It was actually a test. It was, it was one of the Apollo tests that they did. They wanted to see if everything was working in good working order. They had no leaks anywhere. And they filled the capsule with pure oxygen with the three astronauts within the capsule. Of course, in afterthought, that was a horrible thing to do. And it turned out that one little spark caused a very, very bad fire within the capsule that obviously killed all three astronauts. That was probably one of the biggest, astronaut, uh, biggest disasters in NASA's history when they did something that they should have known better. Don't fill up a capsule up with 100% oxygen. They should have used a different kind of gas to make sure that everything was working correctly. I think NASA did a lot of things they should have known better. Well, <laughs> In after the that, the yeah, the yeah, it, it is actually when you think about it, it's it's appalling to realize now in a, in hindsight that they could run that test because any little spark on any of the, the wires, which is probably what happened, they had probably a little spark somewhere that just set the whole thing on fire. So yeah, pure oxygen atmospheres are very very bad. So that's also a good question. So obviously life today is adapted to 21% oxygen. Could life be adapted to maybe 10 or 5% oxygen? Perhaps, but we do realize today that the, the way life is today, if you start lowering oxygen down to 10 and down to 5%, I think that's pretty well the limit. At that point, there's so little oxygen in there that our bodies would not work correctly. Um, the exact number, I don't know, and I haven't seen any tests on that. That actually would be a good thing to test for, is to put people in a chamber, start lowering the oxygen content to see what happens. Of course, we know that when people climb Mount Everest, when they get near the top of Mount Everest, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere at that point is down to about 25% of the atmosphere, uh, of the oxygen we have in the atmosphere at sea level. And we know that what that zone is called. Anything above 26,000 feet in elevation is called the death zone for a good reason. That with only one quarter of the oxygen, people will simply die within days of being exposed to that atmosphere. So we know that once it gets down to about 6%, people can't live anymore. So it has to be above that and significantly above that. We do have people living at elevations of about 15,000 feet. I think that's the maximum uh, continuously habitable altitude for people and at that point you're down to about 60 or 50 or 60 percent oxygen and that's about as high as people will live so people can live with about 10 percent oxygen but not much below that so again i guess that shows why 21 percent is such a perfect number